Yo, it's Heist, and we're back in the studio. We're going through Grieb, uh, and this is part two. Here we go. So on this track, I've also used some uh, parallel compression on the drum bus, um, and I've done that completely with actual Cubase plugins. So what I did was I uh, have sent from the drum bus uh, this, if I go to the mixer. So here's my drum bus, and I'm sending to FX4. FX4 is my parallel compression. Now it's not named parallel compression, I could name it that, but I just called it FX4 for this, for this track. Um, it's easy to set up one of these, you just have to right click here and it will give you the option to do different things, send different things, you know. So it's kind of easy thing to do. Um, this is obviously how you turn it on and this is the dry wet mix. You can adjust the amount here, I've got that set to zero. Um, and what I'm doing on that is, let's go to it. So FX4, this is what I'm actually doing on that channel. Slightly different color to everything else as well, if you notice. I've got a DeTube plugin and a compressor. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm really sort of smashing this, look, and, and this you actually look at them when they're playing. Okay, so look, it's nearly on fire, mate. <laughs> no, we're burning down the place with this guy and then we're going absolutely crazy with this over here. The compression is shown here. Look up, it's basically no recovery or anything. So super, super smashing up the sound, but we're only mixing in a very small amount of that there. And I can turn that on and off here that's what we're actually mixing. So we're taking the send from the beats onto here, we're then processing it separately, and then just mixing that back in very low at minus 21 dB. Let's turn that off. And that's what it's doing. So listen to it with it off. On. very subtle but when you take it away it's almost like it's lost a little bit of dimension and, and, and top end clarity for me. That's what I was going for. You can see I've taken all the bottom end away so we're not getting any kick representation or any snare really. We're just getting the clarity and mixing it back in very very small amount. You might notice that the tube saturator is before the compressor. Um, I've tried to kind of I guess warm the sound and, and distort it through here, um, giving it low end dynamics and then that is being compressed rather than me compressing it and then adding low end dynamics which is what this plugin will definitely do to any sound. Um, so that's one of the reasons I've got the these two the way they are but you can just experiment by doing that. You can move these two about to see if you prefer it a different way around. <laughs> level. So the level is roughly the same but the dynamic is different. See how this one jumps around a little bit more compared to this as well. But I can't hear a massive sonic difference, I'm going to be honest with you, so it probably doesn't even matter that much. But it does matter sometimes, so it's good to experiment with it like that. And I probably did do that and just left it like that. Um, but that is my parallel bus, very simple parallel compression example that I'm using in this track. And I think that is the drums complete. So drums explained, I'll take it with the intro. There is something else on the intro we need to look at, I notice came in. So it's that long kind of dreary one sound um, that I'm using in the intro there. Let's go and have a look at that. So I'm pretty sure that's massive. 
It is. Um, yeah, and it looks like I've probably taken a preset and absolutely stripped it back because um, there was three oscillators running as you can see and I'm actually only using one because these aren't lit anymore. Um, I wanted to make like a, a noise for the intro. It sounded just all a little bit too kind of ephoral to begin with and it needed some, some kind of darkness in there and that sound when it came in, just sort of... Just fitted that for me in the, in, the, in the way I wanted to go. It just sat and worked for me. Um, it didn't work on its own straight away, but what we're using is a carbon wavetable. Um, we're modulating the wavetable with LFO5 on a sawtooth um, LFO. Uh, two over one. <laughs> I change that. So you can change the length of it basically. You make it quicker. It was on over, it was two over one. So given the sort of trajectory of the sound, that's what I wanted it to do. Um, and it's also doing a few other things if you look. Five's doing, and that's traditional of me, even though it's not actually working, these aren't on, but it was doing these guys as well. Um, that may have been part of the preset or part of what I did, I can't remember. Um, not using any modos, no white noise, no feedback, no filtering. Uh, we are using a, uh, a hard clipper though. Let's see what that's doing. Head into the routing. And I can see that the hard clipper is in, it's actually inserted there, right at the end of any kind of processing. But we're not doing any filtering or anything, so it's literally going oscillators to this hard clip. Uh, it's full wet and it's dry, driven quite a lot. Let's see what. That's without it. Presence and just level really. Just just taking it up. There's, there's probably quite a lot of headroom when that sound is there to when it's here. Watch your levels here and you can see it. I'll turn it off. On. Nearly clipping. Okay, sounds all right, don't worry about it. Sounds good, leave it alone. Um, we've got voicing going on as well, but none of these are turned on. None of the unison spreads turned on. We're literally using three unison just to give it a little bit more, um, I guess, thickness and width. Like, if I put that down to one, it's just quieter. So three voices instead of one, basically. having a look to see if I did anything else. Okay, so lastly, it's just the master effects at the end um, and the panning. So the panning is being controlled by LFO6. It's just doing that. Um, it is panning it 1 over 12. And if I take that, that is literally just taking it left and right a little bit because it's on the amp section. So it's easy, easy sort of process to do. But you can mute it. <laughs> Very subtle, probably just me just trying to kind of move it about in the mix a little bit and uh, not really achieving much. Um, I put a classic tube on there as well. That's pretty light, modest, modest dry wet and um, you know an easy drive. Then a dimension expander which is actually insane. I've gone pretty crazy with it because with it dimension expander it depends what you're trying to use it for. If I'm using it for bass I'll often have it quite tight, but when it comes to sounds like this that I want to sort of travel and kind of just be part of a composition in the intro, for instance, then I'm going to I'm going to use something like Dimension Expander probably a little bit more, um, you know, over the top maybe, just to see if it works. And without it, it doesn't sound too bad. But with it, sounds better. Bit of EQing at the end as well, quite a lot. If I turn the EQ off, it's quite kind of dull. I'll put it on. So I'm adding a little bit of low, very small amount. And then we're doing a sort of low mids boost here because we've got the frequency right down. 
So depending on where you have this and where you have this, these are kind of in tandem together. Make sure you're kind of aware of that. Um, you boost here, obviously. Um, you can, but actually, that's actually cutting because the boot, it's actually set of zeros in the middle. So if you're using, it's boost is a funny thing. It shouldn't really be, be called boost. It's a bit confusing. You can actually cut with this, and I'm cutting low mid out of that sound by doing that. So I'm, I'm reducing this from the middle, which would be subtractive, and then I'm choosing the frequency here, which, you know, you're a bit blind, but use your ears. Um, depending on where you have this, it'll be, you know, this is going to be high mid. Um, this is going to be low, low mid here. Um, again, it sets at 12 o'clock traditionally. It's put it down to there. And then high shelf, quite a lot of that, brightening the sound. Um, yeah, very simple EQ method, but it works. <laughs> That's, that's the actual patch explained, I think. That's, that's how you make that sort of sound. And then I'm using two more Cubase plugins. Um, the Roomworks is a fantastic reverb. I use it a hell of a lot. And it, because it's a Cubase plugin, you know, it just makes sense to use the door stuff if you like it. Um, we're using it as you know, two second reverb time. Um, quite a modest mix, 41. And you can see all the settings there for you. You don't need me to go through them. Let's see what that's doing. Let's turn these guys off. So this is dry. The reverb. Very much giving it the dimension of shine and just clarity again. Um, the tail I always kind of call the reverb, you know, in these situations. Um, some sounds you want to trail off, some you want to sit in the mix properly, but this is definitely a sort of more tail because I've got a larger reverb time. Uh, my size is set differently as before as well. I had 20 in um, the other reverb when I was using it, but this one I'm using it at 92. Um, and I've narrowed the width a little bit, it's not at 100, I ever noticed that. Um, the pre-delay is tighter, it's not 50, it's 32. The mix is kind of similar actually, 41. Um, everything else is probably pretty much the same. You know, low and high end, you can adjust how much reverb you get. You, you know, if you want low end reverb or high end, you can adjust it here. I think that sometimes on traditional setup, when you load this up, it'll actually be down here. So you can see I've produced more by putting it up to there on purpose. I did that because I wanted more of the brighter reverb. And then just a simple mono delay after that, uh, a half dotted, 50 feedback, low cut of 220, high cut of 15k, and the mix at 25%. And that does that just gives us that little bit of travel, like that. And then I've got a studio EQ here, which isn't being used. I look, I tried to take the low end out of it, and this is one of those instances where I realise that. You know, I don't need to take the low end out of it. It's actually fine. I like it being a little bit, it adds presence being low. It adds presence having that weight to it. So I left it off. Um, that's all I've done on that sound. Traditionally, people don't put reverbs before delays. Um, I do. I do, I do a lot. Um, why do I do it? I guess I'm getting the sound reverbed as I want it to be, and then I'm delaying it, which is exactly what I'm doing here. You could essentially try moving that and um, seeing what the difference is. Not a lot, probably very similar. So try that out, but I do actually tend to do the reverb before the delay sometimes. Like I say, I like to reverb the sound and then delay that reverbed sound rather than delay and then reverb the delay. I'll let you decide what to do there. But for me, yeah, we've uh, before delay actually quite a lot of the time. That sound trailing off is to do with the Grebe sound. I think that that was probably part of the vision um, when I put it in there. It dark, the Grebe sound was almost like, if you didn't know what it was, you'd think it was some little critter or some little kind of, you know, creature of horror or something like. Yeah, so when you put those two together, that's quite a and you put it all together. The 
sinisterism comes out in it with the string and the pad and the grieve and everything just, I guess, yeah, subconsciously that's what I was doing with that sound. That's a good, good representative for it. Let's just roll it from there. <laughs> So we're into bass territory now, pretty much everything else has been explained up to there. Um, my bass group's here, if I shut off my drums folder um, and the intro folder now, I can just see the bass just here, it's nice and easy. I always close these groups off, you can open them when you need to, but it's just easier to have it all on the screen. Um, the main bass. The main bass is Reactor. Now Reactor's a bit of a... It's a bit of a realm, really, you know. Um, there's so much to explore in it. I'm, I think I've barely touched 1% of what you can do with it. But essentially, it's a sandbox you can make your own synthesizers in. That's the way I like to think of it. Now, I've never done that. I just use what everyone else makes. Um, I actually haven't got time to do that kind of thing myself, I actually try and work out to make a synthesizer. but. It must be fascinating to do, and some of the people that create these are, you know, they're very talented. Uh, I'm using Razor in this case. It's by Aerosmith, it's a native instruments plugin, uh, and it's one instance of what you can do in, in Reactor, basically. So it, you, you can't get this as a separate VST, you have to run it inside Reactor. Let's just have a listen to the sound. Now someone made reference to this about being like a distressed pig um, to me <laughs> and uh, it does sound a bit like a distressed pig but it's got for me a vocoder element that I just liked. Um, I just played the keys and come up with like a little riff with it quite quickly. Um, it is based on a, I think it, well, I don't know, I can't remember what I did with this if I started this from scratch or not but I definitely tweaked it from whatever it was. Um, and, and come up with this kind of sound. Um, what's, what's essentially happening is, is if you look in Razor, here's your oscillators, so just like in Massive, you've got three oscillators, you've got two in uh, Razor. And here's where you select your wave type. Now it's a bit of a different type of synthesis because it's, 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 it's actually adding stuff together and, and although it's, it's kind of subtractive, it's also a bit different. Um, but as long as you've got some subtractive synthesis kind of um, ideology, like you know being able to use Massive, you should get on with this pretty good. I'm using a Foreman um, waveform, and then we're using, in this one, is it on? Yeah, it is on. You can tell if it's on or off by turning those little guys there. Now uh, we're using the sick pitch bend. Let's turn them on and off. So this, let's do the first one. So the sound's pretty much there with the first one. And that's just adding that little bit of, and I do that a lot, that's probably what I put in there. Um, that's almost like a sawtooth detuned. And it just fills it out a little bit, very small amount. I haven't got it fully amped, and I haven't got this one fully amped either. Um, the filtering section, we're using Vowel, you can hear that straight away. If I turn that off, so that's the actual sound we're getting before the filter. Um, and what you can do is change, get different kind of feel for the sound by moving these vowels. Notice they're all A, E's, O's, U's, uh, it's a vowel filter. You can get different combinations, I settled with that one in the end for this, for this, uh, this track. Uh, and you mix them here. So if I had this fully to the top, I'd be just getting the A, I'm actually getting this one the most. So I've got it there, and you can automate this, and you know, loads of stuff that you could do, which I'm not doing. There is some automation going on here, envelope two. Uh, you can assign your automation parameters here just by clicking on these little guys here and going to say LFO, and you just click and drag uh, on that, and you can give it LFO two. So yeah, I've just put LFO two on there to show you how easy it is to modulate in Razor, basically. Thank <laughs> you. 
just and if you're used to massive this will be kind of you know similar to what you're used to uh, you can just reduce it to nothing again by you know resetting it there and pulling this down you get a little number that shows up there when you adjust things like that as well look keep an eye on that in the middle underneath where it says voices right there um, and then you can know when you've actually uh, set it to what it should be which is zero um, I've got a little bit of envelope modulation going on there like I say number two is doing a, a small amount and then the second filter which is happening is this comb filter comb notch and it really brings out another harmonic in the sound it's a bit without it very fl it even looks flat look at the output on So this is basically another type of filter. I've got some. I've got LFO one modulating that a little that cut off just a little bit. You see it happening there when it comes to life on the cut off. And also LFO one's doing the phase. Okay, stretch is on as well, and it's tuned. Tune base it makes it a bit more staccato, and then stretch obviously stretches the sound out a little bit. So lots to play with and easy to use as well. I'm not using Centro, I turned it off, but you can do quite a lot with this. Okay, but I'm not using that in this case. I turned it off. It probably did have a setting I got rid of. I'm using a unison, so that's the basic sound without very kind of sawtoothy, resonancy, nosy kind of. Once you add that unison spread, whole different world. Um, high speed, um, rather a large amount as well, but the ramping is is low. If I take the ramping up. Doesn't make it quite as anic. It doesn't sound like it's got as much anarchy about it, and it's definitely doing something spectral as well to the sounds, giving it a little bit more stereo image. And then we're just driving it at the end, giving it a bit of distress, a lot of dirt. Um, you know, under fifty percent drive, but I'm also using safe bass, very lightly. You notice it's not really making much difference. You could probably get away with that not even being on. Um, but safe bass is good. You can always add bass with this, which it won't do in this case because I'm probably filtering it. Let me have a little look. Yes, I am. I'm filtering all the low end out here. Look, um, but you could have you, safe bass was in there, so I'm just leaving that on. Um, and that's pretty much that sound really. There's not really any mod going on on the pitching or anything. Um, I'm just detuning the sound by 24, uh, minus 24 semitones, which is two octaves. Now there is a glide going on. I've got the glide set to 12 o'clock, um, but it only happens if you sort of start playing notes one after the other and held down, you know, sustained notes. It will start to glide about a little bit. Um, the LFO one, which we're using, is set to a sawtooth and the rate is set to beat. So that is syncing, I think, if I change the LFO. Yeah. I think that's pretty much that explained. Um, hope you got something from that. That's the main sound. And then on that, we've got a little bit of processing, but it's only EQ taking away all of the, the low frequencies with a, just a simple Cubase low, low cut, just under 300 hertz, and then a little bit of a mid-range cut at close to 1.5k, 1 1 1500 hertz. I'm just taking 5 dB out there of the sound. Bypass the EQ here. Just cleans it up a little bit. Reductive EQing is always best if you're going to EQ, I think. I don't like to EQ, but if I, if I do, I kind of strategically um, subtractive EQ, yeah, every time. And I think that's, that's that sound full. I don't think there's anything. I need to check the mix bus. 
Yeah, I don't think there's any sending going to any other reverbs or anything. That didn't have any reverb on it. So that's that sound. Now you can notice there's a layer underneath that and I can see it here. It's the reactor sub. So what I've done is I've taken another reactor now. So let's get rid of this one. And this is a second reactor now that is just doing the low end frequencies for the sound. And you can see straight away I've got a low cut going on on the basic Cubase EQ. Um, let's just side of this out. Yeah, so it sounds, it's like a dulled out version of what we've got already. So I took, a, took, took an exact copy and EQ splitted it. I put the high end and got it right. And now I've got the low end that I'm getting right on this other channel. And what I've done is, I've left the oscillators on, but you could turn those off. Sometimes if you want to just get a sub, you can turn those off and use the safe base here. But they needed to be in there to provide the character for the low end, and you've got to watch out for that. You can't just put a sub underneath something sometimes. You need to you know, sculpt and do the EQ splitting cleverly to kind of get the best result. Um, and in this case, I needed to have the, the mid-range, the low mids, all in there from the original sound. See what safe bass is doing here. Yeah, so safe bass is definitely doing its thing here. You can see if I turn that on, we we got a low end presence. Um, but it's not just the low end presence. If I turned off the oscillators, then I just get that. Cool. So that's the same sound, um, and all that's happened is I've taken it and low passed it basically with this EQ. There was a compressor on there, look. But I think I tried to do some side chaining and uh, ended up not using it. You can see it's bypassed there, so just leave that alone. Um, but yeah, that's that. That's the first bass and the sub covered. So now put those two together. No sub. No top end. And we can use the PAS analyzer. So, not completely mono. You know, I don't know. It sounded good on the sound system, though. Um, let's just have a look at where it's actually mono, though. And this is what's interesting. If you look at the PAS analyzer, you can see that there is a clear indication of where it is two signals and where it is one. And that's why I know that this was fine because this is one white signal which is clearly indicating our low end frequency is mono, mono compatible. All of this that you can see going on here, which looks a little bit worrying, isn't actually worrying at all. This is kind of going on over here in your mid-range and your, you know, your high mids. But your low end is actually quite stable and good and solid when we add that to the now we're getting a full range in the good stereo i like to call this a good stereo you know decent stereo signal and dynamic range for the um dynamic range and it's also good for the spectrum do you know what i mean this is a good area to have it sitting when you start getting into these outer realms it's not necessarily the end of the world but look out because that will not convert well to mono um and you can see it's in there and the low-end compatibility is mono-compatible. Let's move on to what comes in after the first bass, which is a little... Right, so it's the sound from the intro, but it's got a bass line added to it. Notice that. You can see it here coming in with no bass, and then here I've kept it in, but I've added a droney um, sub to it. And it sounds very similar to the first sound. I think it is. Let's have a look. Be able to tell straight away. Yeah, so the first two oscillators are turned off and we're using carbon here. So it's the same thing. I've EQ splitted a sound, I've taken the top end and put it on the intro, and then for the drop I've actually um, kept the low end signal of the sound and mixed it in underneath it. Uh, what have we done to it? Oh good, we've, we've used our bass. So I'm going to talk about our bass, and we've also done some EQing. 
yeah. Okay, so that's a little shortcut in case you didn't know in Cubase, you can get to your master bus there just by clicking on that, should you ever need to. It takes you straight to your master bus like that. And then you can just go back to where you were. So it's a nice way to navigate without you having to get the actual um, mixer up, which can be annoying sometimes. Let's just turn our base off. Have a listen to it without. Let's turn it on. Definite sub increasement. Increasement is that even a word? <laughs> Definite sub increase. Um, if I turn it off, keep looking the analyzer for a sec. It's difficult to even see, to be honest with you. But it definitely, I can hear it getting a little bit subbier when I've got that on. And basically with the R base, it is just a low end massager, basically. You set your frequency that you want to sort of do that at, and then you increase the intensity. I usually turn this intensity right down and then increase it slowly till I get the desired effect. And sometimes it clips, you know, um, not all of the plugins that do that I use, but sometimes this clips, but I don't get any kind of uh, horrible artifacts from it or anything so I just use it as it is yeah so that's all I'm using on that just that just I think that's it nothing else and that's just layering underneath that sound <laughs> It's there again on its own without the sound. See, it's just like a muddy kind of bass, but it on a system it really kind of rumbles. Well, oh, that's the first different one I've heard. That's another massive patch. Fruit Bat, Jim's Fool. God knows, um, I definitely made this one from scratch. I remember making one one thing one time called Fruit Bat. And um, <laughs> I don't think I ever used it in its, in its original incarnation, but there's many different um, incarnations of it. It's one oscillator. Um, and for me, it reminds me of like a, a Mega Drive s s a sort of sound effect or a NES or something. Um, what we're doing is we're pitch modulating it. We're, we're modulating the pitch with LFO 6, which is set to a performance mode. Uh, very simple one as well, just just, just this ratio, one to one, um, the crossfade for the sequence all the way up. Obviously, if you wanted this sequence, you'd be going all the way down. Um, if I change that, straight away you can hear the pitch has changed. So I wanted that long kind of transition. Um, I'm just using a simple um, smooth square. Know if you change that to a normal square, it doesn't sound much different to be honest with you. Um, intensity all the way up, amp all the way up. We are running in parallel mode, so I am mixing this with this going all the way into filter one. Okay, you can, you can see that series mode, parallel mode. I'm not going to go into what the difference is because it will take too long, um, but I just want to explain this patch. So I'm running this in parallel and I'm sending this to filter one and only to filter one. Um, I'm doing a little bit of mod oscillation. Before we get to that though, always kind of travel down here to here. And that's giving it a little bit of detune. Very subtle. Um, I'm, I'm not even, I don't think I even moved this very much, but it definitely did something just setting it on to oscillator one. Uh, no noise, no feedback. Let's look at the voicing. Yep, just one single voice. So there's nothing that went on there. Uh, checking all these others, yeah, that's good. So it would be the filters next. So if I take the filters off, that's the actual sound we're starting with before. Um, add a band pass because really we're actually only using filter one. 
So add your band pass here, you can select different ones here obviously. And as I add filter 2, nothing's happening, and neither should it be, because of the way that this is running. So if I take you to the routing section, I can explain it better. Oscillator 1 is going straight to filter 1, and then it's coming down here, and we're out to the master here. So think of it like that. Way my mouse is going. Um, bandpass filter is being modulated by performance 5. See that indicated clearly there. That's what it's doing without it, and obviously, as I'm increasing it, that's what it's doing, it's full potential. And if you hold it down, it'll just start to go through this chain of stuff. As you can see, it's starting to travel through each time. So I'm using this very, very sh small sort of envelope with a with a sort of light decay give, to give the sound that that sort of feel. And then I'm not using any inserts, so I don't need to talk about that. It's really about the the final effects. Did I mention expand? And notice what I said about bass is true. I kept it pretty dry and pretty small on the size with the dimension. Fairly noticeable, but it does do something. It definitely does in the mix, makes it sound a little bit more um, just where I wanted it to sit, I guess. So yeah, the dimension expander is on first, and then I'm using a chorus, modest dry wet, sort of 35%. Um, the rate is usually set at 12 o'clock. I've just put that down to about 11, and then not really touch the offset or the depth, and I haven't used any EQ, and that's how I made that sound. Simple. There's one insert on it, um, and it is just a level gain, a dummy level gain that I was probably putting on there just because it wasn't standing out right. And I've actually put 9.21 dB into it, which is a tremendous amount of gain, but if I turn it off, that's where it needed to be. That's all I've got on there. No. No actual other inserts. I've got some EQ though. I'm rolling off the bottom end. I think if I take that off. Yeah, so I'm just cleaning it up a little bit. Um, it was actually too heavy in the mix uh, when, I, when I first got the sound. So I just took out the low mids and actually rolled off the bass. 100 hertz on the roll, on the low cut. And then the mid range, you know, 277. I've taken down minus 8.5 dB there. Uh, and that's it. I think the gain might be down on it a little bit, you know. Yeah, I've turned, sometimes I turn the gain down here on things. If I think that they're sounding too loud, instead of adjusting the channel here, I'll, I'll, I'll change the gain just so that I'll know that I maybe thought that was too loud and turn it down a bit there. And if, say, an hour later that I'm, I'm kind of go back to it, I see that there and it's all right, I'll just, I'll then go and put the amount in here and put the gain back to zero. So that can be good for kind of, you know, if you're not sure if about something is too loud or not, you know, just adjust the gain, turn it up or down a little bit, and then maybe later on go and check that and then actually commit to it on your channel fader should you feel that it needs to be there by obviously changing this to zero and then whatever gain it was, um, comparing it, it's a good way. Rather than just turning it up or turning it down all the time on here, I like to do it here and, and just sort of like, then it's non-destructive. Okay, so this is a sample I think I found that I didn't really do very much to, as you can see, it just, I must have just sort of been going through stuff and heard that worked at a certain place when I auditioned it and I just put it in there. Um, that's definitely not pre-production thing that I've done, but it's a Reese, some sort of Reese from somewhere. Yeah, didn't even do anything to it, just left it, got it the level right and left it alone. It's quite a good sound, you can hear it's processed already. And there's another one here. Go to this one. Now that sounds like it's got something on it. Yeah. Roomworks Reverb again, staple of my uh, production tools is this guy. We're using it with quite a large reverb time again. 
I want to give it some tail and 25 on the mix. You can see all the settings there, small diffusion, larger size, width at 100. And without it, it just it will just die immediately. Cool. So just they're just kind of helping the main bass really keep trying to keep it interesting, I guess. That's why I was putting those in there. <laughs> You can hear that little fill come in there from the intro, I think. Yeah, it's the same one. It just comes in from the intro and revisits us again. And as a couple of extra notes start creeping in, you can see there in the yellow, I always mark my extra notes with a different colour so I can kind of visually see where it steps up a little bit. Right there it's almost like a little kind of foley moment, I call them. And what's actually happening is there's an effect that comes in. Um, it's a tapered reverse down the bottom here. So it's like a stinger, basically just kind of quite kind of harshly in there as well on purpose to kind of make it so it sticks out. And the track comes to a little halt there. That's to do with um, a little edit I'm doing with stutter edit. So if you have a little look. Put the drums in. See how it kind of dies there and that little comes in. If I take the tape out, the tape would rever re um, reverse out. That's what stutter edit's doing. This is basically just like a little, um, I, I use this as a, a MIDI control this with my keyboard. Um, and basically what it does is it just, every time I do a new edit, I, I do it a different color. So over here you'll watch this and it will jump to a different setting. See? And then when we get to this red one, it's going to change again. So I use it like a little edit plugin for, for things. And um, in this case, I've used it just to do like a little, I can't really describe it. It's like a buffering of, of gates. Um, it's really good at gating. It's got some panning going on. It's got a width for the gate. And then we've got a lo-fi sort of effect. You can hear that sort of bit crush sound. If I took that off, it won't sound quite the same. So that's crushing up the sample rate and then you've got the effect of the rate of the actual um, thing here so you can change if it's more subtle or if there's quite a lot more of it. I've just got it set in the middle. Um, it's mad because it feels like the brake actually kind of disintegrates and then I've got that sucking tapered sound coming behind it. And when you add all that together with all the transition. <laughs> The hi-hats pick up and all of the intro comes back in because it's the bridge and we're coming up to the 65, 64 bar mark, so this is the bridge. Intro elements are back in. A few more little edits on this guy. Another one there at the end, uh, you can hear that. I stutter at it again. Every time you see one of these coloured blocks, something's going on. Now the sound changes there, just making sure I haven't missed anything. I think there's like a riser effect that comes in. So just a uh, one at the bottom here. I don't think it's. It came in earlier at the intro. We didn't talk about it, but you know I don't like to just copy riser effects. But if they work and they work and they fit in your mix, then you know, use them a couple of times. It's, it's there for tension, it's part of the tune. Yeah, no reverb on it, just a simple sample that fit and seemed to have the right mix about it. So there the bass changes. Um, it's the same thing, it's a reactor patch from the original that I've just tweaked to make it sound a little bit different. I'm going to try and get the original up and sort of compare them and actually tell you what I've done. Oh, I can see what it is. The phase is different. 
slightly. Um, it looks like the cutoff is different, but that will change obviously when the tune's played, so it might not be enough to dignify the change, but there's definitely some sort of change. I can see what it is. I've changed it all the way to mid for this one on the vowels, look. So instead of having this, this mixture of A's and E's and having it mixed here, I've actually just got it all as mid, and that changes the sound. If I solo each one, you can hear the difference. So this is the original. <coughs> A much more hissy kind of bass um, with more kind of resonance about it, basically. But that's that's how I switch, that's how I switch there at 64 bars. I change the complete sound to that. And a different little bass has just come in there. Uh, this is the reverse bass. So I think I pre-made this um, in a synth, probably a massive, or maybe serum actually, this one. And that's actually reversed. You can hear it. I reckon if I put that back around the other way. Just go to audio, process, and just reverse it again. New version. So I think that's the original sample. And then I've just reversed it. Uh, it hasn't got any processing on it. Again, it was probably a sound that I had, that I threw in there when I was going through different bases to see what I could get to fill this up and to help the main bass. And this is one of the ones I found. And it happens in two places quite straight away and then just mellows out a little bit, as you can see, throughout the rest of the track. So it's got its own kind of characters, the way it works in the track. sort of sound effect comes in there like an arpeggiated I don't really know what that is an arpeggiated chord maybe I think I was probably going through media bay and found this sound um, again just like the, those little basses that just seem to stick out and work in the mix and it is just no processing on it or anything yeah straight in there a little bit louder than it was originally, that's all 2 dB gain. And that is probably a house sample possibly, techno. And it's not got any sort of special reason it needs to be in there other than it just felt right for me to put it in there as a sound effect, it just worked. There's an edit that goes here. Very subtle beat edit. So it kind of doubles the claps up. Really cool thing that uh, Stutter Edit try it out if you if you haven't tried it yet. It's good for that. Um, and that kind of adds to this little kind of thing going on here as well. It kind of all works together in a syn syncopated manner. It just yeah, that's why I left it. I think that's another bass we haven't checked out yet. That's like a a bass that's just going down, like a transitional sort of bass, let's get it on its own. Got the reverb on it, probably the same one to be fair, looks like it, same reverb as I used on one of the other basses earlier in the video. Sounds good. Another sound effect there at the end of the at the end of that sort of transition of sort of eight bars, and that is a dub. That's like a dub um, dubstep effect, I think that is. Obviously timed in for drum and bass, so it was probably half time, maybe I'm not sure, um, can't remember, but definitely pre-processed in another uh, situation before this project. And it's like an alarm sound, just stuck out really nice. I've got the EQ on it? No, nothing on it at all. I actually turned it down a little bit, look, minus six. 
but it really cut through in the mix when I tried to put it in, I think. That's why I put it in. Here's a little another little it's all about these transitional effects really I'm talking about now. These are the last little little things. That's that's like another dubstep melody. And it sounds pretty rough in there to be fair. It doesn't sound like I've done too much to it, but maybe I just maybe I forgot, but no, I'll put a low cut in, but very kind of mildly. But yeah, I couldn't really hear like there was much processing on that. We've got the room reverb, the room works reverb on it again. Different setting this time. Sounds a little bit different. No pre-delay, mix of 25% and a reverb time 1.41. But yeah, giving it tail, giving it some dimension. And that reverse comes in underneath that again there, you can see it. That <laughs> I think that might be it, all explained. Yeah, I think that's everything. Finally on the master bus, uh, there's a very small amount of processing going on. Um, you may have seen it as I've been going through it. I've not been trying to hide it, it's been there. Um, the SSL comps on and a fab filter and you might have seen a video of me using the fab filter before it's a great limiting plug-in uh, one of the best I think on the market really really good uh, big up those guys at fab filter um, let's talk about let's just turn it off what I'm doing on just get it looping at a certain point. I'm going to start with engaging the SSL and seeing what that's doing. Not very much by the looks of it. You look at the needle and you think, well, what are you doing there? You're not really doing the needle's not really doing anything at all. It's not on purpose. I only want to kiss the compressor and just get a little bit of the, of the algorithm of the way it works, because it gives you a color. And straight away, I can hear, and that sounds different to when I've got it on to when I've got it off. Let's, let's uh, leave it on. Let's turn it off. Now it's real subtle, but that for me just warms that whole signal up coming through. It sounds a bit cold without it. All I've done is, the compressor is set completely at plus 15, um, trying to give the most dynamic range we can to the signal. I don't really want to compress too much, I just want to um, just see the needle doing a bit of work, which is what you can see there. It's getting back to zero. All right, the makeup is minimal, 1.2 dBs. Uh, attack set to three, and I've got my release set to auto. I've got it set to that because I want the compressor to decide um, for me when it should set the release and by putting it to auto it's quite an intelligent um, algorithm that it uses so it really works quite well. I've got the ratio set to 10. Uh, I'm using 10 because it's at the final stages now and I want it to be quite a potent compressor and I'm not using it that much so it works quite nicely for what I want to get the colour um, and that's it. There's not really anything else I, think I can explain but the way it sounds. <laughs> And then after that, I'm just using the Pro L. I engage that. Yeah, I'm using it pretty heavily. Um, it's doing quite a lot of dynamic, you know, stuff going on in the uh, analyzer there. Um, but it works quite nicely. Um, it stops me from having to have everything. Depends when you put this in at the stage. Sometimes I've made tracks which are running with no limiter on them 
uh, the signal's in the red, and it, I've ended up finishing the tune like that, and it's been fine. And I've released the track, and I've had many hits like that. Uh, that's hand on my heart, the truth. It wasn't until later on that I started to try and develop a way to get the colour without doing that. So, so having it all controlled, that it all went a bit wrong actually, and uh, it can be quite confusing when you actually get a result the way you get it. It's best to just go for that. Um, I found by turning everything down, taking it out the red, and then putting a limiter on, sometimes you still don't quite get that as good effect as if it was just all running in the red. So it's a bit of a grey area. Um, in this case, I've I've kind of probably done this at the end and made the track quite quietly to begin with um, and then put this on at the end. Maybe a little bit of reduction on all the channels, but if you look at my channels, you know, nothing's going too, too crazy. And I'm just controlling it all at the end there with these two plugins and that is it. So that was it, the complete process of Grieve from start to finish. I hope you got something from that. Uh, if you're looking for one-to-one -one tuition, remember you can hit me up, heist121s at gmail.com.